This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 14. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everybody, it's Matt Sicoria coming back at you with session 14 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I've got a great show in store for you today, but before I get to it, I do want to talk to you about, uh, you know, or more so just thank you for the great feedback that uh, you guys sent in. Uh, relative to session 13 of the podcast, that was my discussion with Megan Miller. And we talked about all sorts of stuff, including, you know, how to provide services over long distances and how to provide uh, good supervision and just some general uh, good uh, practice issues and things like that. And to that end, we decided uh, shortly after recording the podcast to set up a panel discussion on these types of issues. So we'll be speaking together at ABAI, and I'll be talking more about those details in subsequent podcast episodes. So stay tuned for that. But again, I want to thank you guys for the nice emails and the thoughtful comments and things like that. I also got a couple of really nice uh, iTunes reviews, and those are really appreciated because it helps spread the word of the podcast amongst the thousands of podcasts that are out there. So uh, for those of you who took the time to write those reviews, I really uh, appreciate it. And if you haven't written a podcast review uh, on iTunes, it just takes a minute or two, and it, they, again, they are greatly appreciated, and they help spread the word. So those are, um, yeah, appreciate that. So uh, getting on to today's show, I have the uh, good fortune of having uh, the opportunity to interview Mark Dixon from Southern Illinois University. Uh, Dr. Dixon is uh, more or less a behavioral renaissance man. He's studied a wide array of topics through the lens of behavior analysis and especially uh, using concepts of uh, relational frame theory and acceptance commitment therapy and things like that. He's done work in areas including gambling, behavioral interventions, uh, instructional practices for individuals with autism, and organizational behavior management. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed journals and has been successful in publishing behavioral analytic work in traditional, uh, excuse me, in non-traditional outlets. So uh, it's uh, he's done a real. Um, Good. Uh, he's he's done a, a really nice job in terms of disseminating our practices to other outlets that uh, they who might not have know what we have to offer. So, you know, we talk a lot about dissemination, uh, and more so in the context of wringing our hands. And uh, you know, he and his colleagues have done a nice job actually doing it. So, uh, hats off to him. And in today's episode, we talk about his book, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for children with autism and emotional disorders and so we uh, excuse me emotional challenges and uh, we talk about uh, how he uh, came into uh, the, the field of behavior analysis how he got into act uh, he gives us a, a brief primer on act and kind of extends the conversation that we started back in session six with dj moran so uh, it, it's it, all in all a, a very uh, very entertaining episode and uh, you, he ends with talking about some really nice research that's going on right now, and I really can't wait to hear the results of what's going on using this ACT curriculum for individuals with uh, challenging behaviors and things like that in public school settings. So again, lots of really cool stuff happening, and um, so I think you're going to like it. But before we get to the conversation itself, I do want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by B-Side 21's uh, uh, training series, or continuing ed series, ABA Outside the Box. Now, as I talked about in session 13, uh, I did participate in a recent CE event. Uh, it's called uh, Conversations That Drive Performance by Scott Herbs, and it was uh, really cool, and it was ostensibly about uh, having those uncomfortable conversations when we're supervising people and things like that. But Scott kind of snuck in some nice, um, you know, a, a nice primer on relational frame theory. So uh, it's an, it's an, it ties in nicely to what we're going to be talking about today. So if you get a chance to check it out, it's at bside21.org forward slash CEUS. So again, that's bside21.org forward slash CEUS. And uh, having said all that, uh, let's get on to our conversation with Dr. Mark Dixon. Hey, Dr. Mark Dixon, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. How are you doing? 
Pretty good. I'm happy to be here. Oh, man, this is uh, quite a treat. I've uh, seen you present a couple of times and uh, purchased a couple of your books, and uh, I could probably talk to you about so many different topics. But I want to talk um, mostly today about uh, your work with regard to the book on uh, acceptance and commitment therapy for individuals with autism and emotional uh, behavioral disorders. Uh, But before we get into that, I always like to ask guests about how they got into behavior analysis uh, in the first place. Can you kind of tell us a story about how you encountered it and how you, you know, kind of chose this uh, career path? Sure. Well, it all started when I had the original um, plan of going into biology until I realized that the classes were all at 7 in the morning and uh, <laughs> the psychology classes were in the afternoons. And uh, those seemed to work better with my social life that I had at the time as an undergraduate. And uh, <clears throat> I ended up taking a, a couple different psych classes and at the same time fulfilling some um, university requirements um, in the philosophy department. And and was attracted to both of those um, disciplines to some degree and and realized that I could double major rather than just take a hodgepodge of electives. And um, and the way the courses were sequenced ended up moving a little bit quicker through the philosophy undergrad than than the um, the psych classes. And and really got into this determinism, um, utilitarianism, kind of ethical, uh, you know, tangents that were following out of my philosophy classes and um, then was taking a learning class in the psych department and and I started to see some overlap between these two disciplines where, um, you know, this kind of quest for understanding the the mind or the the person um, had more of a scientific rigorous foundation to it than just uh, armchair speculation and and that, that was... You know, starting to be revealed to me in behavior, behavioral psychology, and the the conceptual underpinnings of behavioral psychology were kind of fitting along the lines of what I was uh, interacting with in the in the philosophy department with respect to determinism and, and some other stuff, and uh, seemed like this was kind of an interesting marriage of both of these disciplines um, that I wanted to pursue in graduate school because I knew if I just ended with my bachelor's in psychology, I'd end up um, working at the mall selling suits, which is what I was doing at that time. Uh And uh, while that was fun, and I looked pretty cool at the the mall, I realized that there was going to need to be um, bigger paychecks down the road somewhere. So I asked my advisor at the time, um, a big name behavior analyst, Jay Moore, um, at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, what, um, what programs I might apply to, and he suggested I... I try out this this new program that was out at the University of Nevada, where there was a a heavy emphasis on philosophy within a behavior analysis program, and um, took the uh, took the gamble that that was a good fit and applied and got in and um, you know twenty some years later here we are. I see. Um, so was your undergraduate psych department? Uh, heavily behavioral or was it pretty eclectic? Did you have to navigate your way through yeah, you know, cognitive pretty, and social psychology and things yep. like that? Yeah, it was pretty eclectic. But um, while I think that would frustrate some people, honestly, I think it made me respect the entire discipline a little bit of psychology um, better. And um, I think as as I kind of formed my career, um, the stuff that I do dances on the lines of, you know, is it cognitive psychology, is it behavior analysis, and sometimes wearing a different hat depending on the audience that I'm speaking to. Um, so that eclecticness of the department, um, I think, gave me a, a solid foundation that, you know, oftentimes we're looking at the same material, asking the same questions, uh, but just speaking about them in different terms. Yeah, I know that's a topic that you uh, broached briefly during one of your presentations I saw last year at uh, Mass ABA, I think you were talking about publishing in a different journal and having to change your language to kind of sneak in some behavioral mm-hmm. concepts without yeah. them yeah. knowing about it. Essentially, it's a little, little uh, you know, kind of guerrilla, guerrilla, uh, uh, you know, uh, science going on. Yeah, I mean, you know, shockingly, the rest of the world isn't stupid. And uh, <laughs> sometimes we get this uh, naive uh, belief that we are the ones that know the answers to everything. And, and I... I mean, I think we do within our own vernacular, but we need to 
be respectful and, and I think aware of what other people are investigating because they are many of them are pretty bright. Well, that that's a uh, uh, good advice uh, certainly. Um, and I think we we'll, might, might return to this topic, uh, time permitting, but what I do want to get into before we get uh, along um, too far into this d- discussion is, uh, like I said at the outset, I want to talk about your uh, acceptance and commitment, commitment work. Um, now, there will, by the time this uh, episode airs, we will have already featured an interview with DJ Moran, and he and I have this kind of wide-ranging primer on ACT. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of all over the map by design. Uh, however, I want to make sure that in case this is the first podcast episode someone listens to, that they get a little bit of background on, on ACT if they're not familiar with it. So uh, in the spirit of that, you know, do you have kind of like a, like a Reader's Digest definition of I know it's so broad and complex. And sure. you know, I, I had up, up until uh, probably the last couple of years, you know, my, when someone asked me what act was, I would be shake my head and like, I don't know, it's that weird stuff they do in Nevada. And, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, but, uh, I, I've come to appreciate it, uh, quite a bit, um, approaching it more as a, you know, not necessarily something clinical, but more of a, you know, kind of a philosophy of looking at, uh, you know, life in general. Um, but, uh, uh, can you give us your, you know, uh, elevator pitch, if you will, of, of what ACT is? Yeah. Um, what, I, what I believe it is, um, is a way to um, find, um, find yourself in greater enjoyment with what's going on around you right now, be more aware of what's going on uh, right now, experience both the good and the bad, and then uh, moving your life to something that you value moving um, towards a, um, the things that you always kept in your head that someday you'll get to that um, you actually start doing rather than saying you're going to do something. So what I believe ACT is um, is a means by which we can live a more value-driven life Okay, uh, by getting to the... Um, both the complexity and the simplicity of, of the present moment, and then uh, also reaching towards and, and attaining the things that um, we have always wanted our life to be about. Okay, and uh, what I'd also want to do, I know ACT is uh, the whole idea of it is to, or actually, I let me, uh, before I get too far down this, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the, the idea is to, to uh, develop what's referred to as psychological flexibility. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And there's, there's six processes that uh, contribute to one's psychological flexibility. Mm-hmm. Can, you, uh, can you talk about those processes real quick? Sure. Um, the, the, the first process, and again, these things are, are not linear. They're more contextual. And so as I define one... It doesn't. Uh, um, I'm not assuming that it comes before um, latter ones in this in this sequence of six. But um, one of the processes is uh, being in contact with the present moment, being um, right here, right now, and not um, worrying about a uh, constructed future or reminiscing on a past that you cannot change. But just being here in the moment. Um, the next one would be um, uh, diffusion. Or uh, somehow being able to uh, treat thoughts for what they are, just noise in your head, just thoughts, and not necessarily get entrenched and, and, and um, interwoven with those thoughts um, such that they come to define you. Um, we all have various things that we're worried about and thinking about, and sometimes we let those things become the essence of who we are, and, and really they're not. Um, the, uh, another one would be um, values, and those would be the um, things that we tend to um, want to try to attain in our life, whether it be uh, better spirituality, um, closer to family members, a, a healthier lifestyle, these kind of long-term delayed consequences or, or life directions. Um, a, another process would be committed action. It's, it's fine to have those values. Um, but if you're just able to talk about them and not actually move towards them, um, they're empty. And I think that's what oftentimes happens with, with many of us, whereby we, um, we know what we want to do, we know what we're supposed to do, 
Um, however, we delay that stuff till tomorrow, and that tomorrow never comes. So is the committed action kind of like the behavior plan, if you will, of this? Of this? Yeah, it kind of is. It's kind of the, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do to make this, uh, this wonderful little story about how your life is going to be better if this happens? Um, how are you going to actually make that come true? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, oftentimes that, um, people don't know what exactly they're going to do. Um, the, uh, so I did uh, present moment, selfless context. I'm sorry, um, present moment, diffusion, acceptance is, is another one of the six components. Um, and here, the kind of the goal being that we all experience both good and bad things in our life. And uh, it's probably kind of imp- not going to happen that we're going to be able to navigate through um, life without any um, distressing thoughts, distressing experiences and emotions. And as a result, maybe it would be better rather than fighting all of this um, to simply um, give it the, 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 the time that it deserves to accept that it, it does happen, that it is a natural part of life, and, and just keep, keep, keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes we get so entrenched in trying to suppress these things that um, we fail to do anything because we're spending all of our time trying to fight this thing that unfortunately is never going to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I believe the, uh, the last process um, to, to cover is uh, um, selfless context. That one seemed whenever I uh, you know, teach, act, and class, that's the one that nobody really understands. It's the, it's the sixth one that is, is kind of, you know, we, we can memorize it, but we don't really understand it. Um, and that is, you know, kind of in a, in a quick one-liner is being the real you. Um, what is the real you? It's, it's somebody that transcends across um, various settings and contexts. Um, you're not just the, uh, the parent. You're not just the son. You're not just the uh, um, colleague, but rather you are this, there's this core you that moves across all those settings and places. And oftentimes we spend our um, lives trying to be, define ourselves by content of where we are or or what we're involved in, and, and oftentimes missing this more kind of universal person that um, transcends both time and place. What are the barriers to kind of grasping that concept? Um, I think the for a behavior analyst, all this stuff is hard to grasp, I think. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, that, that one, I think, is, is very hard to grasp because it almost um, has a spirituality um, flavor to it, I think, um, that, that is often dismissed in, in behavior analysis, and not necessarily religious, but more of a, uh, uh, this kind of, how can you be multiple use um, at any given time? And it just seems a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe mystical. I see. Um and, and as a science that's built on skepticism and and, <laughs> and data yeah, and, and all that sense, yeah, I haven't I haven't counted any uh, self as context um, examples as I sit and observe my nine year old on a daily basis. <laughs> it's, it's just it, it it kind of takes a, a few leaps of faith that I believe most uh, you know measurable, countable behavior analysts are not necessarily willing to uh, to kind of. Um, Except, hmm. so I guess that's probably an easy transition here into you know what are some of the main criticisms of of, of ACT that you've encountered as uh, someone who's written a lot and thought a lot about it. Well, I think there's a lot of them, um, and they come from different different camps. I think the the mainstream behavior analytic problem with ACT is that it is um, defined. I mean, everything that I just defined those, those components as it sounds very non-behavioral. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not operationally um, defined terms. They're, they're not precise. They're not countable in many ways. And I think that um, that's unsettling to, um, to many from my discipline. Um, honestly, when I was first introduced to ACT and, and these, these concepts, they, it seemed to me even um, on the surface to be non-behavioral. Um, because it, it was just not what we did. It's not what we published. It's not what um, 
the field has kind of uh, been founded upon. I think that that is a problem um, that I've heard. Another problem is that it is uh, uh, it seems to work for everything. It works, you know, it's the the behavioral uh, you know snake oil, and it, and it does anything and everything. Oh, we got a problem with recycling. Well, let's just do act on it. Uh, you got a problem with anxiety? Let's just do act. Um, act, uh, you, you know, we don't have electricians, uh, you know, working hard enough. Let's just do act with them. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I think you and I were talking about this on the phone the other day. It's almost, from, you know, kind of like a, you know, like, what can't it do? It's almost right. like, a, like a Seinfeld joke or something. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, I, I remember um, a discussion um, with a, a pretty prominent behavior analyst um, who made those, you know, some comments like that. And, and as a result, uh, was very skeptical about the approach and I guess I you know my response now um, is that um, is that is this not what we speak of uh, when it comes to defining uh, what reinforcers can do reinforcers work for anything and everything if they're you know we you know or electricians not working hard enough well let's give them some reinforcers if um, you know you're not studying hard enough well let's give you some reinforcers so I think that the <clears throat> that argument is somewhat empty um, if you approach um, ACT as a purely functional intervention that is uh, formless. That it, it, we shouldn't be defining this um, change mechanism by the topographies of, uh, or the populations that it, it has worked with or that it could work with, but realize that you know, if, you, if you are a verbally competent human, um, ACT will work with anything that you encounter. Mm-hmm. It's a just like a reinforcer would work. Honestly, I think it probably works better than reinforcers once you start talking because those those tangible things that we dangle in front of you, um, once you're verbally sophisticated, don't seem to necessarily always govern your behavior in the predictable ways that we would hope they would. That's just not an, an opinion. That's what we've known for like the last forty years in behavior analytic research. Um, once people start talking. This whole schedule reinforcement thing does not necessarily work. I see. And um, how would you differentiate ACT from, you know, and I'm not a clinical psychologist. I, uh, <laughs> I was an EAB guy in graduate school. So, um, but traditional, you know, let's just call it cognitive behavioral psychology. Yeah, I mean, there's a few, there's a few um, ways, I think, that are critical in which it differs. One being that in traditional cognitive behavior, um, behavioral approach, the, the emphasis is on symptom elimination mm-hmm. or symptom reduction, um, as well as um, thought suppression. And with ACT, the, um, it's, it's somewhat the opposite. It's not um, thought suppression, it's rather thought acceptance um, to realize that you're not going to be able to fight and suppress those thoughts. And um, the instead of symptom elimination, this would be uh, more symptom workability, meaning that you, you will have these symptoms, you are going to have these issues. So, how are we going to teach you to work around them? I see. Yeah, that thought so, suppression of, of you know, uh, I haven't read the primary sources just to be you know transparent, but uh, in, in um, some act uh, materials, I've read that the thought suppression itself uh, is actually counterproductive. Mm-hmm. It makes it makes the thought more prevalent. Yeah, I mean, if I say to you, don't think about a pink buffalo right now, what are you thinking about? <laughs> exactly. I, don't, I really don't want you to think about it. And, it, and it's there. And I think that um, when it's things like don't think about, um, you know, your past history of, of failures and don't think about being anxious and don't worry, everybody loves you. Don't worry, you're going to be, live, you know, a happy, happy life. Those are the things that we then get entrenched in and, and can't uh, um, shut down. Because the, the storyline is to, to try to suppress it. And as soon as we are telling ourselves not to have a thought, it seems to show up again. I see. Cool. Well, that's, that's a pretty concise rundown. I thought we did better than I, uh, than I predicted. So um, good job. Um, I want to transition and talk about uh, the, act, the ACT book. Uh, I've uh, got a copy of it, and I've recommended others purchase it uh, on, on many occasions. Um, and uh, I know you've got a couple of ACT books out there. And just to, again, just to reiterate, it's the uh, ACT for uh, children with uh, autism and uh, emotional behavioral disorders. Um, 
And what I was curious about, was there, can you tell me the story of how you thought about its application to this uh, population? And you know, was there a specific case or a specific circumstance that, you know what, I've, I've, I've got to put this curriculum together or something like that? Yeah, actually, there, there, there were a number of factors that kind of um, came together at a, at a unique time for me, which, which resulted in this book showing up. Um, one of them was that I was getting more um, heavily entrenched in um, doing language-based interventions for kids with autism and uh, using traditional behavior analytic approaches, trying to teach them, you know, to request things and ask for stuff or label things and, and basic conversation skills and and realize that the material that was available to these kids was pretty basic. Um, and there was this whole sub population of kids with autism in these schools that were not, that, that had far exceeded um, the behavior analytic um, materials that seemed to be available for them and were still failing miserably in school. When you have a kid that can sit in a, in a regular ed classroom, um, you know, score, you know, standardized scores at higher than the, the neurotypical mean and still freak out for days when he thinks that there's going to be a fire drill or when, um, you know, they got rid of chicken nuggets on the menu. Uh, it seemed that, that there were these, <laughs> these weird things that were happening um, for these kids that, that, you know, I was getting asked to, to put some input into um, in terms of intervention. And, they, and this, the behavioral stuff wasn't working. I mean, having this kid self-monitor his thoughts or, you know, giving him tokens for not... Uh, you know, freaking out at the um, at the fire drill, it, it just seemed so below the level that these kids were struggling with. It was it was this constructed world in their head that they were that they were struggling with. They were struggling with language and the traps that language often gets us into. And you know, some sort of contingency management plan was was the opposite of what was going to work because those things had been done repeatedly with these kids. And, you know, they'll work for a few weeks and then the kids get bored of the reinforcers. So rather than um, trying to um, just do another one of those, what I would believe is somewhat empty interventions, I, I thought that maybe these kids could benefit from an approach that looked at how to restructure, the, you know, their language and the, store, and the rules that they were governing their behavior by. Um, and that act was probably an appropriate place to start. Um, what then happened was, you know, again, I was being called in on a, you know, a kid here and a kid there, and we put a few things in place. Um, we started using um, Steve Hayes' Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life book, but then trying to bring it down to the level of the kids, um, because that book was, you know, written typically for, for neurotypical adults, and, and started to, um, you know, get a little bit of success with some of the mindfulness or acceptance um, pieces in there. And realized that many of these kids were, um, you know, they didn't necessarily want to talk to you and talk about their thoughts and their feelings, but rather um, they wanted to do something uh, that might resemble an activity that could have a, le- you know, maybe a lesson of act embedded within that activity. So rather than talking about a Chinese finger trap, um, like I think Steve does in that book. And how you know you you have to push in to to release that trap from your finger um, to actually let's go get some traps and let's go um, play this together um, and let's do you know a couple other examples that are similar to that um, where the kids are experientially um, engaging in these activities at a level that's more um, unique for those kids um, and again you know with kids with autism. We wanted it to be some something not that threatening, something that was um, easy for them to understand, and and at one level kind of fun. So so that I guess the the absence of that type of on the shelf um, solution led me to starting to build some of these activities on my own, and then what what happened was that um, a school district. Uh, uh, approached me and said, we have a number of kids that are very, um, you know, high-functioning, academically successful, that have considerable behavior problems. Many of them have comorbid autism with uh, emotional or behavior disorder. Um, 
do you think we could do something like that with them? And I, you know, thought, well, I don't see why not. Um, again, if you do believe ACT fixes everything, um, <laughs> then maybe it could fix this as well um, if it was delivered in the appropriate format. So uh, over the course of the next few years, um, I started working on, on designing a curriculum that could be introduced to kids um, from K through 12 that had um, some you know, diagnosis of autism and or emotional um, disabilities that we could try to uh, you know, bring this very highly sophisticated therapeutic approach down to the level of a, of a daily um, social and, and emotional exercise for these kids. And what's been the reception from the students that you've worked with? Uh, do they look at some of these act? I mean, um, how, uh, how 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 uh, readily do they participate in some of these activities and lessons and things like that? Do you have to kind of cajole them at first, or or you know? yeah, I, I think it it depends. You know, I mean, we'll do. You know, I've had experience working with this population using the curriculum. Uh, in one-on-one -on -one settings, just me and, and the child, or um, large group settings where it's the whole class, or maybe even five classes together where you might have 60, 70 people in the room together trying to do these uh, activities. Um, and I would have to say that uh, it depends. It depends on the kid. Um, you might have a child that is is more than excited to get involved with these things and um, there's nine of those kids in the room, and we got one kid that's writing, uh, you know, curse words on the on the pages right. telling us to go to hell. And, and, well, that's uh, the kid I'm. That's the kid I'm thinking about. Uh, oh, you yeah, know. yeah. You we've, know. I could, <laughs> I've got a, a number. I've had experience with a number of those guys. What is cool with those kids, however, is that you start to see that showing up for them because I think that this act thing actually starts chipping away a little bit at that world that they don't want to interact with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're saying, hey, you know, you, we're not going to tell you to forget about all these bad things that mom and dad did to you, or we're not going to forget about these thoughts that you're lonely and that people think you're weird. We're going to tell you to embrace these things. And, you know, they're coming from a, a, a culture and a life of trying to shut all that down. And we're saying, no, that's all right. We got other things to worry about. You keep those thoughts, you keep them going. But we, we've got these other cool things that we want to try to get you towards. Um, so the reaction has been, I'd say, overwhelmingly positive from the kids and the outcomes, I believe, um, support this. Um, but we, okay, you know, we will have a few kids here and there that are, are going to you know, push back hard against this. So, you know, especially, I mean, think of an adolescent boy. Um, they, they're not going to want to you know, tell us all about their feelings and their worries and their thoughts in their mind. And I think the way that we have been able to get those barriers broken down has been to be a, a active participant ourselves in that um, experiential activity. What I mean is that when we talk about, you know, we talk to them about, um, you know, what are some of the, you know, the worries that you're carrying around in your mind today, that we actually tell them the worries that are going on in our head today as well. Mm -hmm. So, because I think probably, honestly, the, the, the most, um, the most important thing I feel for these kids is that they realize that we all have this stuff going on in our minds and it's not just them because they have a disability. Um, this, I remember vividly, um, a, um, teenager that I was working with, um, you know, a few years back, and uh, talking with him and, and asking him about, um, you know, why can't you just, you know, get your work done at school and why are you always, you know, getting in uh, these fights with the, the, the um, staff? And he's like, well, I feel, I, I just feel lonely. I just feel like I'm weird. I feel like nobody, that everybody's looking at me. And I said to him, well, you know what? Sometimes that I feel that way too. And it was like he had this, this aha moment or just this, this confusion moment where he said, well, you don't have autism. And I said, well, yeah, but that doesn't make you have those thoughts. Being human does. Mm -hmm. and, and he was like, I think he just thought that was part of his disability and that's what made him weird. 
And nobody had ever told him, hey, it's okay to be this way because we all are to some degree. Um, so, so based on what you said there, Mark, um, so I'm picturing in my mind a group of kiddos and you've got the, you know, the one kid with his arms crossed and has probably mm-hmm. scrawled something you know, uh, that's not you know, fit for, for you know, public consumption on the paper. Sure. And he's saying, this is Dr. Dixon, this is stupid, sure. you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, do those kids eventually, for lack of a better term, get with the program once, once, once you are able to kind of um, dig right into this in the way you've described? Yeah, I mean, they do. I think what ends up happening is um, the way that we will run it in the, in the places that I'm kind of uh, you know, working with to some degree. I mean, we, just, we run these sessions every day with these kids. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they're going to um, be in that, in that experience in whatever they, way they want. If they're in the background saying, screw you, I hate you, um, we, we just say, okay, that's an interesting take on today's lesson. Let's go on to the next child. And so there's really not this um, kind of enforcement as much as, you know, we're practicing what we're preaching. We're going to accept that that kid has some thoughts about this that are a little bit, um, you know, adversarial, and, and we've got other things to do. I mean, we live the model. We've got 10 kids in the classroom that we're trying to get, uh, you know, to a better place, and that's the thing that we value, and uh, we're going to accept and diffuse from the one kid that's, uh, that's getting out of hand in the, in the background. The truth is that those kids come around because their peers are there already, and they, at some point, you move from being the cool kid that's making wisecracks to be in the, the foolish kid that's making wisecracks. Mm. Um, and, and we've seen that time and time again. Now, again, I've, you know, there will be the one kid that, you know, the one or two kids every now and then that just keep shut down. And, and uh, usually you can look at what's going on with them more contextually and see why that's happening, whether it be, um, you know, some family issues, comorbid um, mental health problems, you know, drug usage. Uh, there, there's a lot of these, you know, I, I, things that, that are going to interact with what we're trying to do. Um, but it is truly the, the anomaly that doesn't get on board with this. I mean, honestly, <clears throat> I've, you know, there, there's a number of classrooms I can tell you about where you've got kids on it with ankle bracelets that are, um, you know, very high functioning that are on probation or on, on um, you know, some sort of house arrest. I mean, some really intense kids with, with significant, um, you know, criminal histories that, you know, after a few weeks, they start opening up about their lives and, and what they tell you will truly humble you um, and make you, I think, understand why they didn't want to do their homework. Um, sure. So. Sure. I guess it's, uh, it's what, uh, I guess, uh, Pat Fryman calls the contextual view of, uh, <laughs> of, of life. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the kids that you're describing, you know, obviously they're, they're very fortunate to have, you know, someone with your level of expertise and your, your team out there in, uh, you know, Carbondale. Um, what I'm curious about uh, is someone like myself who does not have, um, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I spent graduate school working with, uh, you know, opera and chambers and, you know, and things sure. like that. Didn't go to uh, UNR. Um, and, and, and I guess where I'm kind of uh, getting at here is what, what level of training does one need to kind of successfully implement this, uh, this curriculum? Sure. Um, I think that the way that I wrote the book was so that you can grab the book, read the book, and, and start tinkering around with um, the, the, the lessons um, on your own. Um, obviously, the more that you've gone to workshops and had training in, in the therapeutic model, I think that would help, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, I ran into a teacher last week that went to a one-hour, um, you know, here's this act book thing and what it might do in your classroom. And six months later, I bumped into her and she said, my classroom and all these kids have changed so dramatically, I can't even believe that this thing worked. And I said, I can't either um, because I'm always humbled that, that something, you know, that I've created actually could, could yield such positive outcomes um, for just a lay person that has no formal training in behavioral analysis. Or, so I, I think that, 
you know, obviously, um, you know, if the random person picks this book up and wants to introduce it in a classroom or to utilize it for um, their their own child, um, it's going to. I, I think the content is sufficient to um, be able to get some positive change to take place. Some of the things that you know that are that are somewhat idiosyncratic to the model, uh, like accepting thoughts and, and separating um, yourself from the thoughts that are in your mind. Those are so. Those are such anti-Western civilization concepts that um, the reader is going to be somewhat skeptical. I think, or many readers will be, um, which may yield them to go through the motions of reading the exercises and think change is going to happen. And honestly, that's not going to happen. You you need to be entrenched in this. You need to believe it because those kids are going to see right through you if you don't. I see. And is it recommended that there, I mean, for, for those who don't have the book, and um, uh, which hopefully we'll, we'll remedy that to some degree with this conversation, sure. but uh, um, there's 180 lessons. And so, I, you know, I, I, I guess with anything else, dosage is important here. And so um, would it be the case that, you know, the, you know, it's, a, it's probably 180 for uh, a specific reason. That's the typical length of a normal school year. Uh, right. and, and so it's, these are daily practices, essentially. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, what I did was to I, – I, there's a lot of books on ACT out, out there, and people that are interested in this area um, only have to Google it to find hundreds of, of options. I, I think that what I've done is to provide more of a curricular uh, workbook than an actual – um, comprehensive account of the, the therapeutic approach. And so somebody that is implementing my curriculum, I think, could benefit from getting a better handle on the actual understanding of what ACT is than the the quick cursory um, overview I give in the, in the book itself. Really what I wanted to do was to say, okay, ACT, ACT works, here's the six core processes, and um, let's get right into how do you implement this with these kids. Mm-hmm. So um, you could you could survive without the uh, additional understanding of what ACT is about. However, I think that you'll be a better um, implementer if you kind of got a more comprehensive understanding of what um, challenges ACT was trying to um, bump these kids into. I see. Is there a uh, an act primer that you'd recommend? And if if you want to answer this uh, at a different point, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to, uh, uh, we can come back to this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on um, you know what, what who the person is mm-hmm. and what their previous experience is. Honestly, I think the easiest one to um, to understand is the "Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life" book. Okay, um, and and that because I, I honestly feel. Um, like you have to have um, asked yourself these questions and, and, and struggled with this um, approach to some degree yourself before um, trying to sell it to the kids. Okay. Um, and so that's when, whenever I, I'm brought, I am brought in for a training um, on how to implement that book, um, uh, the first few hours of that training is really about getting the staff um, through – the core processes and make them experience those processes in their own life in the brief ways that we can in those in that short amount of time. And then once they say, man, this is kind of freaking me out about my own life, then I think we can hook them on being good implementers for the kids. Because if the staff don't buy this thing, kids ain't going to buy it either. Right. I get it. Um, One thing that, we talked about the other day on the telephone when we set up this uh, interview um, is the, if I'm not mistaken, you've got a school that's going to be using ACT as its kind of universal behavioral intervention. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with that? That seems yeah, pretty fascinating, especially in the context of, you know, the world of PBIS and, you know, uh, which I don't, you know, which is, you know, probably, probably right now the, um, you know, if, if some if a superintendent or a principal was looking at a universal, you know, uh, a behavioral intervention, sure. that would be probably what pops up most readily, sure. amongst other things. But that's that's yeah. what's out there, you know, and that's probably more um, reflective or more um, readily digested by us as behavior analysts. Yes. Uh, so, yes. can you talk about how you're using ACT in this context? Uh, sure. Um, 
a little back history on this uh, comes from the uh, successes that we've had at um, a smaller um, uh, kind of um, standalone school for kids with autism and and or emotional behavior disorders, um, whereby 10, 15 different school districts would would provide those students to um, our standalone building um, because they were too difficult to manage within the district. Um, they were too disruptive. They were in, in one way or another. They may have, um, you know, engaged in some criminal activity or some uh, significant disruption that the school district felt that they needed to go to a more uh, restrictive placement. Mm -hmm. um, for the last four years, that building has shown um, meaningful and sustained changes in the lives of those kids um, in, in many ways. Um, one of them that had districts start paying attention was that we were able to reintroduce them back into their home district um, successfully. Um, those home districts then wanted some additional support with managing the emotional and behavior challenges that these kids had. So, you know, we provide them a little bit of training on, on how to introduce the ACT model. Um, and as soon as that starts happening, then, you know, one district in particular um, said, well, maybe we should have a room like this here at our school for kids that are at risk to being um, sent away to a more restrictive placement. And then that room became a, uh, a critical resource for the building and they, after some struggling with success using TDIS, um, they decided let's introduce ACT um, as the um, school-wide behavior management system for the entire building of a thousand kids. So starting this fall, um, that will be launched in, um, in, a, in a district um, in the East St. Louis area. Wow, that's exciting. Um, is this something that you guys will be reporting uh, once you get some, are you, are you, you know, is this part of, a, you know, um, an applied, you know, science uh, 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 endeavor, or is this is this just practice? In other words, are are, are, are the rest are of us going to hear about uh, how this yeah. all pans out? Yeah, I just need to stop sleeping, and I can get all these data out. Um, but uh, seriously, the the uh, some of the outcomes from the the original act school will be, um, we, you know, we need to submit them for publication. There's a number of thesis projects that came from it, and uh, and this other work, and then this this very large scale initiative. Um, I'll be uh, discussing at a um, at, in a talk at um, ACBS this summer. Okay, very cool. Um, and so, with regard to applying the ACT model to the whole school, is there good? You know, and I'm just trying to think very, very fun. You know, prag pragmatically mm -hmm. and functionally here is is are you are they going to do like a like almost like an a, an advisory where these with these exercises are covered on a daily basis is that how yeah. that's going to go down there's yeah i mean that's already in place in, in many in many districts that um have had you know some encounters with the book um where a uh, elective course has now uh is now being offered in the district um called act and kids get credit for it really yeah yeah um and that is a awesome thing I think to have happened. Um, not only because they're using my book, um, but but honestly because <laughs> well, that's I, awesome too. Don't, don't yeah, nothing, no, nothing wrong I, with that. The, the, the more important thing is that I think um, the non-behavioral, non-clinical, uh, non-research um, uh, populations are starting to see some value that ACT can have, and um, and are realizing that um, any kid, regardless of disability or not, could benefit from. Um, moving their life into a better place using this approach. Now, it's funny you say that because I think you mentioned something related to that point when you uh, gave one of your workshops at Mass ABA last year and that if memory serves, you were saying something like the, the non-behavior analytic, you know, we'll just call it helping professions, mm -hmm. are getting hip with ACT. Mm-hmm. Way more quicker than mm -hmm. than we are as as uh, BCBA types. Is that is, is it, am I characterizing your comment? Yeah, correctly. Yeah, I think that that's probably accurate. Um, I think the reason why is that it's in language. It's a, ACT has been distributed and 
uh, in a language that everybody other than behavior analysts speaks every day and understands and is willing to um, be comfortable with. As behavior analysts, I think what what's missing for us as behavior analysts is the description of act in a operant, um, objectively measurable um, terminology that, that um, we're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. You know, most behavior analysts will say, um, you know, if, if we don't get schedule performance or we don't get the behavior that we want um, for somebody that's verbal, we say, well, their behavior is rule governed. They've got some rules going on in their head or self-rules, or they're following instruction control. And that's fine. That's true. But how do those rules get there? And how, how do they make sense of the world through some interaction with the environment um, and get those rules to govern their behavior by? I think the answer is an, R, is an RFT and ACT, um, but I don't feel that it's been articulated in a way that that master's level BCBA is ready to understand. I see. Um, and is that just a product of kind of where we are as a field right now? And, and the, and the, you know, I, I, I think as, as, as a profession, you know, we could probably make the task list, you know, uh, I, I guess there, there's probably some level of restraint that we'd need to apply. Otherwise it would get completely unwieldy and probably a lot of yeah. students listening to, I have a lot of students who listen to the show and they're probably thinking it's, it's unwieldy enough as it is. Yeah. And then you add something like RFT, which is, which is very challenging for, you know, I just speaking for myself, it's, it's, it's challenging to grasp those concepts. It's one of those things when someone talks about RFT in a, in a, in a uh, talk at, uh, at a conference, something like that. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm really digging this. I can see. And then I walk away and then I'm like, wait a second. I, you know, it's kind of like, am I going to do this tomorrow? That's right. That's yeah. right. And it's, and it's kind of like studying a, a foreign language in high school, you know, and it's like, right. if you don't use it every day, you know, you might be able to ask for the bathroom, but you won't be conversational in French or Spanish. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's my main mission to try to change all of that. Um, my, my main goal is to, is to make um, the RFT um, terminology simple enough that the master's level behavior analyst is finds utility in it and can and can implement it tomorrow after they hear about it today. Um, and the same with ACT. If you look in, you know, if, if you page through that ACT book of mine, um, there's no technical terms. This yeah. is just all straight. Here's how you do this stuff. And I think that you know, as a pragmatic science. And getting back to utilitarianism of my early days in, in philosophy classes, at, at one level, if it doesn't have utility, it's useless. And and all the conceptual underpinnings of it, and all of the philosophical, um, uh, you know, comprehensive comprehensiveness of the approach doesn't matter if I can't get a clinician out there that working in the front line with these kids to carry this thing out. So my instead of trying to, to um, I guess, appease the, the intellectual masses in behavior analysis, I'm going from the opposite direction. I'm going to get those BCBAs to see this thing as so useful that they can't ignore it. And then if they want to find out more about the theory behind it, more about the empirical research behind it, there's other outlets. Um, but if I can't get them to see the utility in a day, they're not going to buy it. I see. Yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, the proof is, uh, is in the pudding and if, uh, something's working for them, right. you know, they're going to respond to that. And that, again, right. just kind of getting back to what you said about the other, uh, um, professions embracing act at a, at a probably yeah. a, a faster clip um you know again well, there's, there's a marketing lesson here somewhere yeah. too you know oh yeah those other professions don't care about the data <laughs> they, <laughs> they see many of them don't you know i mean you know i am a behavior analyst still um i i know the difference and, and you know we're we're entrenched in data they they want to see uh you know a lot of these other professions are like wow that sounds interesting i'm going to try this tomorrow and they go out and do it Mm-hmm. We, on the other hand, sit back and say, I need, you know, 19 peer-reviewed studies and I need to make sure that you got your terms right and you haven't, you know, defaced the, the, the legacy of 
of Skinner and, and other people before before moving forward. And and honestly, you know, you got to do what what works first, and and then worry about how it fits into the system second. And guess what? If it doesn't fit into the system, maybe we need to figure out a way to redefine the system. Yeah, and that's probably another reason why you mentioned ACBS, and for those who. Um, may not be familiar with that's the uh, Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, which is the uh, that's essentially the flagship uh, professional organization for ACT, pe- all all things ACT, correct? Yeah, and and relational frame theory. Oh yes, yes, um, and uh, yeah, that's the membership for that is is growing at, at leaps and bounds from what from what I understand. So. Yes, and it's probably because of that. Um, what? A couple other questions. I know we're uh, we've kind of gone all over the place here, but um, and I know we've uh, been on the phone here on Skype here for a little while, but I don't want to keep you too too long. But I've got a couple uh, last questions, um, and these may or may not be act related. I don't know, um, but I just want to get into some a couple of quick questions about just general practice issues, uh, advice for BCBAs. I know uh, I spoke to a, an SIU graduate this morning who's out there doing great work, and so I know you guys are involved a lot in you know, um, preparing practitioners for the field and so forth. So um, I, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm thinking about is, um, you know, what are, in the spirit of paying attention to things, you know, both within but also outside of behavior analysis, are there other people out there whose work you're you're really into, and you'd recommend that um, we as practitioners kind of uh, pay attention to or take a look at? Um, other people outside of behavior analysis. Well, uh, in, in, in or out, we can uh, we can. Well, I think rather than name names, where where I think um, we need to be paying more attention is. Um, in interventions with people with with more developed language abilities than mm-hmm. we typically have, and so I think we've got this this uh, you know differential reinforcement thing down pretty well. I think we've got uh, you know preference assessments down pretty well. I think that where we need to be start paying attention to and reading and, and challenging authors to um, write about is what do we do once people start talking? What what do we do when we have a, a language sophisticated person? that exhibits minimal um, rates of, of significant problem behaviors, whether it be, um, you know, um, threatening to burn down the school once every six months. Um, you can't do the traditional frequency counts of that behavior. Right. Uh, I th- and so what, we've, what I've seen us do is to dismiss those, those cases as, uh, you know, the problem for somebody else to deal with. And, and to me, that's disappointing because our science was supposed to account for all human behavior, not just high-rate human behavior. Um, and, and as a result, I, I often feel that um, we, we sell ourselves short. Um, we need to be uh, exploring more uh, language-based interventions. And, and I believe that um, you know, relational frame theory and its, its clinical application of, of ACT um, hold great utility for us. Um, so in, in terms of where listeners can go to get more information on that topic area, would the, uh, the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science be one, uh, one yeah, place for that? that? That would be one place for it. Um, I think that uh, um, on the, AC, the ACBS website, um, members have the ability to access every uh, published paper on ACT and RFT in a, in a uh, downloadable database. Um, journal, journals are, even the mainstream behavior analytic journals are starting to be more um, open to these approaches. Um, you know, I'm the editor of Behavior Analysis and Practice. I was just going to ask how you're editing, because you, yeah, how does that play into this? Well, you know, I mean, I try to keep my own personal agenda um, out of, you know, out of that and, and separate the roles. Um, but I do have one of the new associate editors is Yvonne Barnes Holmes, um, and she's working on a special issue, a special section on um, ACT and RFT. Um, there's a paper that was just published in the last issue on using ACT for adults with developmental disabilities, which is a population that many behavior analysts work with, um, which could stand to benefit from incorporating maybe some of these strategies in uh, behavior plan um, writing. 
And uh, the journal uh, Psychological Record um, has been around since the 30s, and they've always been um, open to um, and publish heavily on the Act and RFT in that journal. So those would be some some resources. And, and again, I think that maybe some behavior analysts, um, ECBAs, might think that um, ACT is, is strictly like one-on-one -on -one talk therapy. And I'm not su suggesting that they do that. That's really beyond their scope of practice. Um, but there are language-based interventions uh, for behavior management, you know, was, that, that could be still utilized or, or borrowed from the ACT approach. Well, you, it, yeah, it, I, I can definitely see some of those processes being very um, applicable to and, and not terribly outside the mainstream of some of the, uh, you know, behavior plans for, especially for kiddos who, as you say, are, are, are very language able. And I'm thinking particularly of, you know, uh, even things like diffusion and whatnot, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to get up and throw something or, or something like that. Right, and, right. Uh, so you're having the self-rule that you want to throw something. Well, here's a little cue card that says, you know, when I throw things, um, I lose out on recess, and recess is something that I value. Mm -hmm. that, that is nothing more than a rule governed intervention that you're providing a discriminative stimulus to this child to read that statement before they engage in a problem behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not always that easy. Um, but it is, there, there's nothing non-behavioral there. Yeah. You know, it's a description of the contingencies, um, uh, the delayed and probabilistic contingencies that come from engaging in problematic behavior. But, you know, again, those, those linkages are sometimes, I think, hard for us to see as behavior analysts, um, how those all link back together to observable, measurable behavior. Agreed. Um, Okay, last question. Do you have any uh, parting advice for a student of behavior analysis or a, uh, you know, someone who maybe have, uh, you know, just passed the exam, they're out looking for a job or they're in their first job and, mm -hmm. you know, what, what uh, anything, you know, we, I, I think we could probably apply all of what we've talked about, <laughs> you know, sure, as, sure. As, 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 you know, that, so, but if you well, have any I final think, thoughts, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, a couple, I guess. Um, one is that science is evolving. It's an evolving process, and what you learn in graduate school is not the end of everything. And, and getting CUs and sitting in the back of the room and checking your, your text messages is, is far from continuing your education. And so what I'd encourage them to do is to continue to read and continue to um, push um, the science and, and um, the applications of behavior analysis um, to places that it's not right now. There's no reason why um, whatever your job is needs to be the job that you're in. And there's no reason that because nobody's published in this area that you should um, think it doesn't make sense that behavior analysis could work with that type of situation. Um, this is supposed to be a science of human behavior. That means all behavior. Don't, get, um, don't embrace the typecasting that, that has um, you know, made the field what it is because I think that if you push it further, um, we're going to be able to do even bigger things. Um, out there with the world. Great, great. Well, well said, Mark. And uh, I want to thank you for your time uh, today. And I really also want to get you back to talk more about your uh, peak autism curriculum. I just got the direct training module and I'm uh, reading it and sharing it with a lot of folks I work with. And uh, so I'd love to bring it back on to pick your brain about uh, not only that book itself, but all the modules. Sounds great. Happy to do it. Awesome. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I'd love to have uh, Mark Dixon back on again to talk about peak or gambling or any of the other interesting research strands that uh, he's uh, very knowledgeable about. So, um, yeah, so if you enjoy the show, like I said at the beginning, it would be terrific if you could leave a rating in iTunes. But uh, other than that, we will catch you in the next session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>